Welcome to Pre-Tower with K&M Technology Group. Here we will have discussions and presentations with technical specialists about topics or problems that are affecting the drilling industry today. We strive to keep the discussion strictly technical with no sales pitches for products or services. But since we are conducting a technical discussion, for context you should know who we are and what we do. K&M is an engineering consulting firm that specializes in complex and challenging wells. We began with a focus on extended reach wells and have evolved into a company that handles any type of challenging wells, be it unconventional, HPHT, deep water, deep TVD wells, and more. Our highly trained team provides engineering consulting, training and best practices, and field supervision. We also developed ERA, our proprietary torque, drag, hydraulics, and geomechanic software, which makes well planning more accurate and efficient. To learn more, please visit our website at www.kmtechnology.com. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Cutts. I'm the general manager for K&M Technology Group. Thank you for joining us today for our January uh, edition of Pre-Tower. Um, we've got a, a special guest today, or uh, a special guest uh, from, the t from the University of Texas A&M, and along with some other members of the team. So I'd like to allow everybody else that's here with me this morning to introduce themselves. Uh, yeah, yes, I'm, I'm Fred Dupriest. Uh, I'm a professor of practices at Texas A&M. I retired about eight or nine years ago from ExxonMobil. And uh, in those years, I've been working, uh, teaching some and doing some research. Uh, and I also continue to work uh, uh, with the industry, with various companies and industries who are interested in trying to move their organization toward being physics-based and limiter redesign in their workflows. Um, and, of course, that's what we'll be talking about some today. I'm Jason Kroger, Operations Supervisor with a &M Technology. I supervise our Western Hemisphere advisors and all of our field work. I am uh, Mitch Abu Hussein. I'm the drilling engineering manager at K&M. Uh, I think what Fred, F Fred probably doesn't like to, uh, you know, talk about himself too much, but I do want to point out that he is known for the fast drill process back in his Exxon days. He's the one that really kind of pioneered the fast drill process where it pushed drilling efficiency and drilling performance. Uh, I think a lot of people in the industry do know him, and so just wanted to point that out for people that don't. So now we'll we'll jump into our our discussion. <clears throat> so today it's it's going to be a very fluid discussion. So if anybody has any questions or comments at all, please post them, and uh, and we'll do our best to try to answer as many questions as we can um, live. So please don't hesitate. Um, but today, so. We want to talk about the, the fears and limitations that are really holding us back from, from actually achieving the, the level of performance that everybody wants to get to. Everybody that drills wells wants to drill wells as quickly and painfully and, and as with little, little, little pain as possible. Nobody likes to have those calls at 2 o'clock in the morning about things that have gone wrong. And where, in, order, in order to get there, we kind of have to look back at where we've come from. So the, I've, I've put a plot here of the ERD envelope just to give an idea of where we've gotten to as an industry. The, the outline of, of the red zone, which we label as the extreme reach zone, is really the outline of the wells that have physically been drilled, both at a long horizontal, shallow TVD, but also at a deep TVD. <clears throat> um, there are di many different challenges if you're drilling horizontally at a shallow TVD, and those are very different from what you would, the same challenges you would get if you were drilling a very, very deep well. And today we want to go through some of the different concepts that are what's holding us back from the, from whichever type of well we're going to be drilling to actually achieve the level of performance that we would deem as successful. So we just want to look at a couple of different well profiles. So I've just put a, a well profile in here for a very typical extended reach well where we're, we're normally setting uh, 13 and 3 eighths down at close to the base of the curve. We drill our, our 12 and a quarter inch section out to some depth where then we set our intermediate casing string and then drill our production hole section. And I've put this well out to 21,000 foot measure depth. And if we compare that to a US land type well with the same measure depth where you're setting your 13 and 3 eighths at the same TVD, your 9 and 5 eighths at the same TVD, but then you're drilling a much longer horizontal section, 
what are the challenges associated with drilling those two wells in terms of the amount of pipe that you run in the ground, in terms of the total depth that you're drilling. Everything is, is very comparable. But when you look at them side by side, there, there, are, there are some differences, but how, how do those differences relate in terms of what's holding us back from achieving our objectives? So I'll pass it over to Fred. Okay, well, before we leave this slide, <clears throat> so the way we're shaping this conversation today is, is really around how do we drill these kinds of wells or what's limiting us from drilling these kinds of wells faster. Um, and we want to take a methodical approach to that, and we're going to kind of shape this as a limiter redesign approach um, and a physics-based limiter redesign approach. So if you look at these two wells right here, you know, they're drilled by different kinds of rigs, different equipments, different business models, different kind of constraints on them. But in the end, both are probably what you, your ability to drill them faster is probably a torque limited or it's buckling limited. Or, and, and the wells have similar limitations actually. So if we understand the physics of the fundamental things that we see in either extended reach or uh, extreme laterals, that physics isn't that different. And then, you know, kind of the practices that help you, uh, the real-time practices and in, in engineering redesign, some of those solutions are the same. So we're going to talk about these two wells a little bit differently. There are some differences, or, and, and we're going to talk about them as types. We thought by doing these two types, we'd kind of cover the waterfront of what all of you guys, you know, all you folks online might be uh, actually working with. Um, so, you know, I'm going to start where I always start, and, uh, and, uh, and that's with just just trying to keep it a brief explanation of what limiter redesign is. When we approach performance drill rate, and we say, uh, as we raise weight on bit, you know, we get a linear response. And so drilling faster is not harder. It's all about weight on bit. So if I say what limits performance, I really am saying what limits weight on bit. And you need to stick with that. If you start saying what limits me from being a better human being, I mean, real quickly, I mean, almost immediately when you just open it up and start saying, how can we be better? You just get lost. Focus on weight on bit. Now, when you get your weight on bits high and you have depth of cut for bit stability and world management and all that, when you get your weight on bit high and your weight on bit is truly limited or expensive to redesign that next step, then focus on RPM. Because you know, both of them are linear. You get a linear response and performance or P out of both of them. But I need that depth of cut for bit stability, so prioritize that. But what we're doing as an industry right now is we're not running enough weight. And we'll talk about those what limits us really and what we can do about it. But we're really not running enough speed. Uh, speed is, is something we don't play with nearly as much as we should be. And I haven't emphasized it until the last you know, probably a year or two. So we'll be talking about both of those things. So we raise weight on bed until something goes wrong. We call that a dysfunction. And the way we move forward is to redesign the dysfunction uh, so that it doesn't happen until a bigger or higher weight on bed. And the concept here then is you kind of generalize that because it may not be that the bit has something going wrong, but I'm just out of motor differential or um, drill string makeup torque. And so whatever it is that limits you you redesign it until something else limits you and then you redesign that until something else limits you and it's a really just logical simple concept but actually in in organizational dynamics and how we work every day it's kind of hard to do um because i'm all what i'm basically saying what do i change now what do i change now what do i and and that's not really the way we want to do things right we want we want best practices and or something like that that feels really different than the question, what do I do now, or differently. Um, so what we need, you know, to facilitate that change is physics. Uh, as long as I'm sitting here with you and I'm saying, well, you know, I think you should do it this way, Chris, and you say, well, Chris says, well, I think this is my experience. We're not going anywhere. But if I say, well, here's how I think it works. How do you think it works? then we actually have a building block there for change. We, we, we can be logical about it and say, well, I don't know if it works that way, but you know what? I could do this field trial to prove the physics really does work that way. And if I knew that, here's three things we could do differently. 
And so there's a whole different dynamic that kicks in if you invest um, in building steady routine workflow um, to identify what should limit you. Go find something you don't know about it, not somebody with a different experience, but some physical new understanding about how it works. And boom, stuff just starts falling on the table. Uh, so that's that's kind of the basics of limiter redesign. Um, it it has it it's you know redesign what limits you, but you're probably not going to succeed at that unless you also commit to being physics based, and that means training everybody. Whatever pile of knowledge you pile up in your organization about the physics of how things work. If your rig supervisor doesn't know exactly the same thing and your DD and your, your, your bit design, uh, your support in your bit design, if, if you're not all painting the same mental physics, you're not going to make progress. And so training is a commitment. And the other key element in that is management. Um, uh, managers world grew up, if they're older today, in an empirical world. And we didn't know the physics of many things. And you're going to find that, or we're all, I think we all have found over, you know, the last decade or so of trying, the whole industry has been trying to become more physics based, is that um, training has to extend pretty high in your organization or in your daily operational practices, you're going to find yourself constrained uh, from being able to create change. Um, so that's my little package. And we could spend a lot of time on the organizational side of how you get this to happen. But I wanted to lay that out there because that's the approach we want to take for this conversation. In each whole section, and we're going to kind of start at the shallow areas of these wells and work our way deeper. Uh, you know, in the surface hole in industry today, um, in these two types of well types, what's limiting us from raising our weight on bit? And then what limits you? And as you progress, what tends to become your limiter next? And uh, and I think maybe we can come up with some interesting, uh, you know, kind of op- operational things that you can consider in your own organization. Uh, remember that reaming, circling, and tripling is, is, is zero weight on bit. That's, that's what I call it. And it's your top priority always. So it's, it's incorporated into the model. So two fundamental things, not specific things, but really broadly important that everybody understand is that higher weight in itself doesn't wear the bit faster and then we'll talk about rpm um so i'm looking at a delaware well and you know one company is running sixty-five thousand pounds on their 12 and a quarter and another company is running uh 30 or thirty-five thousand pounds and i can assure you if you ask the thirty-five thousand pound company you know what's limiting you from raising their weight on bit they'll say the bit company recommended 35 and that's, that's where we are. And if you ask the 65,000, they'll say, well, you know, as we raised weight on bit, you know, we did this differently, and then we got to here and we did this differently, or we did step test, and we didn't see a problem. So the, 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 you know, the big limiter <coughs> is, uh, and let me tell you why your bit company is doing that, because what they, they don't know how you're going to run the bit. If, you, if you're raising weight on bit, and you don't know how to recognize stick slip, then you can wreck their bit, and you're going to blame them, of course, and you're blame the bit. Well, the company that's run 65 is probably a company that knows how to recognize stick slip, so they're not afraid of raising the weight on bit. But We're how, but, afraid of raising weight on bit. How do you get to that point? You know, because yeah, um, the, the, the intention is to have kind of a discussion about all these limiters and how to overcome them eventually right yeah so if you're working in an organization especially times like this where you know people are very uh maybe risk averse because if you if if you've made it through the last couple of years and you still have a job then you've probably done something right so if 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 somebody hands you a spec sheet that says you know don't run more than thirty five thousand on it the safe thing for me to do is just to run thirty five thousand, and if anybody yeah. gives me gets qu- questions me, I say, well, that, that's on the spec sheet. I said I, I can't run if I run any more than thirty five thousand, and something bad goes wrong, then I get blamed because I was the one that recommended running this bit out of spec. Yeah, so you can't dip your toe in this water. You're you're the what 
the way you run this process I described of raising weight on bid is step tests. That has to be incorporated into your daily operations. You, you actually raise the weight on bid in steps, and with each step, you look to see if that step was okay. Deterministically, with your rig, your well, your pipe, your bit, your moment right now. And MSC is a big part of that. So we don't have time today to spend a lot of time on that. But, you know, if MSC gets worse, that's bad. If it gets the same or better, then keep raising weight on a bit. But that's way overly simple, simplistic. Uh, I don't see stick flip, for example, with MSC. I see it with torque oscillation. So the general question is that you want your company running step tests, and very few people are. But you also have to teach all those people involved in those step tests how to recognize the onset of dysfunction that would damage the bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, and there's there, there's not that many of them actually. And we you know we there's a lot of material out there on on what those are. And I list them right here: bit balling, vibrations, interface severity, bottom hole balling. Well, you know there's a for each of those, there's something this driller can see and and recognize. So you you actually have to teach that to your organization uh, and your management. Remember, everybody all, all the way up the land because the manager's going to look out there and see you raising weight to fifty five thousand pounds, and you know they better understand why and that you're doing a process. Now, what happens if you raise weight and you see a dysfunction? Stop. Right until you re-engineer so that you can raise. What you find over time is if you actually do that, then trouble goes away. Right. Now, this is a remarkable, really remarkable thing, and it, you're asking a really good question. If you raise weight, and everybody knows weight drills faster, if you just raise weight and don't re- recognize, know how to, and stop and re-engineer, you have more trouble, and you do wreck bits. So the, the, the important thing that you said is it doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? It can't be no, like the engineer, no. the, the engineer with the superintendent and the drilling supervisor making the decisions. It has to be an entire organization that understands what you're trying to do. Organizationally, then, there's probably 10 different major talking points we'd need to cover. But uh, you're making a really key one here is that, the, the, well, number one, when you stop, you've got to figure out the physics. Mm-hmm. Physically, why is this a problem? You have to re-engineer it. That's number one. Number two, lesser important than that, is that all of your manager be trained and involved in that process. It, I'm not making it seem trivial. It's hugely important because you won't last long if you keep doing this. You'll get run off, right? Right. Even if you're succeeding, and I've seen that. Mm-hmm. Or being cowboy and, you know, whatever. But... Don't be raising your weight on bit when, if you don't have a process, organized process, uh, um, for recognizing dysfunction and workflow for actually re-engineering it, because you will have problems. And whether we're talking about borrowed stability or any kind of performance limitation, it's the same. Do what you've been doing. Do some form of a step test. And with that, know that you're safe before we make a change. So I think in Exxon Mobil, it, it comes down to like really questioning where some of these limitations are coming from and if you can exceed them without actually making anything become worse. Where these questions are, it's not just where they're coming from, more specifically, physically how they work. If you say where they're coming from, it could be, well, the bit vendor said I can't, yeah. right? So it's really um, a little, little bit you know, different than that. So we started doing this process what you'd call fast rule like some mobile in 2000 and in serious you know the whole world was probably on board in 2006 and between then and 2010 we double footage for day while our well complexity went through the roof you know tremendous extended reach double footage per day and we woke up in 2010 and realized we didn't have any trouble where did all that trouble go And we had actually started with about 20% trouble worldwide on average. And for our well mix, that that led the industry. We were down to 12.8%. And it was like, what just happened? And we didn't do it on purpose. We weren't aware of what we were doing. We just simply redesigned what limited us. 
what happens if you actually look at what limits you and understand its physics and physically redesign how you work, it turns out that our operations are surrounded by all kinds of things that we just let hang out there. A little bit of instability. Well, it's okay. We're surviving. A little bit of this, you know, a little, well, we're seeing high torque oscillations, you know, but, you know, maybe we're okay. Uh, we don't have sticks that maybe, or maybe we, we don't really, but let's just try this weight on a bit and drill three wells and see how that goes. We're hanging, we got stuff hanging out. If you actually go after it and make it just go away, you end up with a very um, clean operating environment, if you will. The, the things that are limiting weight on bit are exactly, almost all of the things, you know, vibrations or whatever that cause motor failures, that cause steering issues, that cause all of our trouble. So uh, don't go into this saying, if you drill faster, you will have less trouble. But honestly, if you redesign what limits you to drill faster, you will have less trouble. And, and uh, we, that's proven out with many operators and it wasn't just, you know, uh, many independents I've worked with since then. Um, your percentage trouble may not change because you've cut 30% off your well, but you're literally having less trouble. Fred, how much does uh, bit selection play into this? Because uh, Mitch's point of it doesn't have any cut-offs. effect whatsoever unless your new bit was addressing a dysfunction that prevented you from raising weight on bit with your old bit. So, so more blades, change of cutters, rotating cutters, bigger cutter sizes. Huge misunderstandings around all those because you've had empirical experiences that said those are important but they were only important in your well because of the dysfunction you happen to have. I can go to another well and try to do the same thing. And if I haven't actually been raising weight on bit and seen a specific kind of bit damage, and I was doing that change for that bit damage, you know, making the bit tougher, I'm just slowing the bit down and I'm not changing the actual damage because the damage was due to whirl. And when I reduced my depth of cut, I have more whirl. So if I don't understand the physics, the, the whole thing about bit redesign is to understand physically why the current bit is limited. Okay. So those are, I don't want people on the, uh, listening to misunderstand that. All those things are important, but they're important as long as you have identified the dysfunction correctly and your change in blades or, or size of the cutters or everything is correctly addressing that. And to dysfunction. make that happen, you must... You must establish and stay within the framework of a limiter redesign workflow. Right. You've got to do step tests and identify what limits you and redesign that before you. It, now, uh, it, it all pops out of that framework. Now, I'm, I'm sounds like I'm trying to keep dragging the conversation away from your point, but no. I'm not disagreeing with your point at all. Mm-hmm. But we keep jumping to that point. Right. The real issue is that we don't we don't operate with that framework. Right. And I think. So a lot of people have tried to duplicate the fast drill process and have not succeeded. And I think it's because of this redesign process that they are not understanding that that's a critical part of the fast drill process of identifying the limiter and trying to solve it and changing it. And it's not, it's not just a change in your parameters and increasing your MSE and you're going to achieve it on day one. To some you know, so we're going to burn about half our time here. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say that. So for, but, but for, for, gotta, for everybody listening. But I have to answer that. Yeah, I know. I have to answer that because it's, you know, I've probably worked, I don't know how many independents I've worked. I don't, I don't consult for fees, but I do 1,500 hours a year of pro bono work. Mm-hmm. And that that's all the way down to, you know, going in and training and and getting on the daily call every day and doing an analysis every day till everybody gets imp- practice is implicated, imp- imp- well, implemented. So they do succeed day one. So that okay. that's not correct. Okay. If you train the driller and the DD, the rig crew, how to do step test, how to recognize all the fun- dysfunctions, and that's at like a two-day class, 16 hours. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and then you get the hell out of the way. Sorry, but I mean, really that's what it's about. They'll go out and do step tests and they'll drill faster and they don't have the fear of doing that because they're, 
they're they're doing the things and watching for the things, and now they have confidence that, and they'll go to sixty five thousand pounds in one well, mm-hmm. and they will knock thirty percent off their well in one well. Your issue becomes if you didn't do all the other organizational things. Number one, you haven't redesigned anything. Engineers haven't done anything yet, so they've identified a limiter at these high weights and they've achieved this great. And I haven't worked with a company yet that didn't knock at least 30% off their well. We, we just drilled geothermal well, instantaneous oil piece, five times faster than the offsets on the first well that we went in with mm-hmm. this kind of process. So, in granite, right? Right. So, I haven't seen that yet. The issue is that if you don't pay attention to all these workflow things, if you're not training if you're not identifying limiters, and if the engineers aren't really redesigning them, if management isn't in the boat, management's going to look up and say, what are you doing with that weight on bit? And you're going to go backwards. And we actually call it, it's kind of a, there's, a, there's about a one-month dip. Mm-hmm. It's when management figures out they don't know what you're doing. And then the field figures out, management doesn't figure out, it doesn't know what they're doing. And you go backwards. You And it's almost, it's pretty predictable. Either you... Get that sorted out, and, and when you implement this process, this is going to happen to you. When you get that sorted out, if you get it sorted out, you head back up. If you don't get it sorted out, you just go back where you were. So the workflow, you know, are you training? Are you creating knowledge at the rig side? Are you sustaining it? Are you teaching all of management? There's, you know, that, that's another hour of sitting here and talking about the things we've learned about that. And, and, and we didn't do all that well at ExxonMobil either. Big companies have a different business model than small companies. The easiest place to do it is a smaller company. A larger company with 17 worldwide drill teams like we had at the time is actually a much more difficult place. Um, and, uh, and it's hard to achieve it and sustain it over time. So, there's a, you know, Mitch, you're, you're, you're making a really good point, but I will say that if you teach the physics and the practice, you will get results. Mm-hmm. Whether you sustain it, or not is a involves a whole lot more than that so i just want to point out that, so for everybody that's watching we have four pages of topics that we wanted to cover <laughs> and we are on one topic yeah, number three topic number oh, three wow <laughs> on weight on bit but i would i i think it would make more sense and it'd be more valuable for the people listening if we actually went through specific topics and covered them thoroughly rather than just giving them blurbs of each one. So let, let's expand a little bit more on the weight on bit. Like what, what limits us? Um, we, t- we talked about, you know, maybe the, the, bit it's, the, the bit specifications are one of them. One of the things that we talked about the other day is um, limiting weight on bit or directional control in a vertical well. Um, you want to expand on that a little bit? Well, <clears throat> uh, for, first of all, it's not, it's not bit wear. All right. So if you have higher weight on bit, your bit travels at a de- greater depth of cut. Mm-hmm. And bits wear at the tip based on how far each cutter slides, not how much weight you have. Because the more weight you have, you just indent, you, you increase your contact area. The force for area stays about equal to rock strength, no matter what weight you apply in total to a bit. Its contact area goes up because the cutter depth of cut goes up. So... A modern PC diamond just hardly, it's really hard to make it wear in most of the rock we drill. This, this wear right here is from drilling over 400 feet of 30,000 PSI granite. That's, that's not much wear, right? If you pull that, someone would call that bit green, really. You'd, you might rotate a diamond and rerun it, but you might not even do that. So that's, the diamonds don't wear. So what we do to bits is actually dysfunction. We bang them with impact from whirl, or we, you know, we overload them in tangential torque or something like that. Uh, so the fear of weight on bit itself is, uh, is a major factor if you don't understand this thing, that high weight in itself, that if I have a higher depth of cut, higher weight, I actually slide less distance to drill the given amount of footage and I have less wear. So higher weight reduces the wear dramatically per foot of hole drill because I'm traveling at a higher depth of cut and I'll slide less foot distance. And 
And, and that's just so hugely important. It's like one of those fundamental physics-based building blocks that gets most people kind of to question a lot of things they think are true. Uh, if we're shallow, um, so as far as what, well, and secondly, RPM, it's not fear that either. And I haven't talked a lot about that, but uh, if we turn the bit faster, the bit will get hot and that will damage the cutter. No. Well, kind of no. Kind of yes, but kind of no. All right. So again, we're back to the problem. Is those of us that grew up maybe in the 90s or 2000 or something like that, the, the cutter technology is so different now that whatever empirical experiences we have are just not right anymore. So they are thermally resistant. They can operate at such high heats, and, and it doesn't accelerate their wear or create a, a major problem unless it's pretty extreme. Um, and when we're drilling five, ten thousand, maybe fifteen thousand more pound rock, and that's where we are in a lot of our unconventionals, you should drill ten thousand feet and pull a nearly green bit, uh, and it should be almost independent of what RPM you change. So I've seen six hundred RPM and twenty thousand psi rock with no th big thermal problems, for example, um, and. And what we're talking about in our unconventionals and probably our extended reach is something like 300 to 400 RPM. If we're really redesigning and we, and we get to what we consider to be high RPM with the motor on it. And, and I'm not afraid, afraid of that at all. Now, what can happen in very hard rock that's also abrasive, like this granite here, is that that little flat right there, the, the granite... Uh, I don't have a problem with RPM in general with a PDC diamond as long as it's sharp. What happens is when I develop a flat and now I've got a lot of area sliding on that granite, that friction, high friction granite, and this heats, flats are my problem. And if the flat gets big and hot enough, it will create a thermal problem so that the diamond pops off of the stud or, or a substrate right here. So that's, but that's very specific, and it's in a very unique environment now. In most of our drilling environments, our diamonds are not going to be bothered at all by four or 500 RPM. Certainly any of our unconventional laterals, we should be running, you know, when we, if we can get to 0 0.49, 0 0.5, 0 0.79, 1.0, mo I mean, we're running 1.0 mo motors all over the pocket, you know, turning 350, 400 RPM. So... We have plenty of empirical evidence now that a modern diamond doesn't have an issue with that. The issue we have with, with rotational speed is actually vibrations. And um, if we have a limber assembly, it's kind of like a jump rope. And the faster you turn a jump rope, you know, the harder it pushes out. So what tends to happen is that it rubs on the wall and I develop friction. Um, and also, I just get a bigger flexor in it with speed if it's limber. If we design our stabilizers right, though, and it, what this is is a two BHAs with different stabilizer placement, the blue BHA would, would actually develop the standing sine wave that looks like this based on modeling. And the red BHA would develop a sine wave that looks like that. It's got anti-nodes, and it's got nodes where it's really quiet, anti-nodes where it's really loud. Well... That, if I have a flexible kind of BHA, and, and, I, and I shouldn't really say that because it's way more complicated than that, if the stabilizers are in the wrong place and the natural shape is, are we still live? No, yeah. yeah okay, that's not a problem the then. If the natural shape is large, then that's not good. Okay, so, but this is forward whirl. It's just a jump rope and it's kind of smooth and it's not that violent. The real issue we have uh, is resonant speeds. If I have a, if I have a, don't have the right stabilizer placement, and I turn exactly the wrong speed, it really gets violent. So this is a really excellent paper published about uh, that shows a lot of downhole vibrational data, uh, lateral vibration, and red is bad and blue is good. Um, so what you can see here is that when the drill string was being turned 160 RPM, it was, actually, it was actually pretty quiet and really quiet at about 163 RPM. It's quieter at 163 RPM than it is at 120.
Um, yeah, because, you know, from a world standpoint, a straight blade is going to tend to gear about the contact point. And that's uh, and that tends to enhance. In, in fact, you're kind of playing in my next slide. If I if I what what we want to do as an industry is do step testing RPM just like we don't bit, and identify those RPM that we do not want to be at. It's not necessarily a low RPM. Now back to my limber assembly. If you have a limber assembly, it's going to get inherently worse with faster RPM. But if you have a properly designed assembly, you can turn it 160 RPM as long as you avoid that resonant speed. And those bands might be 10 RPM wide. So where it's getting speed gets complicated. Bit speed, the bit itself doesn't have a problem with RPM. It's a drill string speed and put a motor on it and there's no problem. It's the drill string speed where we're, we're going to trigger resonance uh, more so than the, than the motor, though they play together a little bit. But, um, and if I start getting, then what happens if I start getting high contact force from having that, that high forward whirl um, pressing against the side of the hole with frictional rock particularly, I kick myself backwards off that rock from that contact force. And now we have backward whirl, which is 20, 30 times more violent than forward whirl. So here's the segue. Operationally run step tests. Identify places with resonant speeds. If you're resonant, you're probably going to see an increase in MSE. If you have downhole tools, you'll see what they say. But you're probably going to see an increase in MSC and use that as an indicator as a place you don't want to turn your string. Find a low MSC place to turn your string. Um, but and it's going to be really important that whatever information you are getting from your BHA, that you're you're measuring it in G's and not in some standardized even scale. A, even G's doesn't mean anything because that's not standardized either. And your, your other problem is that... Um, where are your sensors located in your fancy schmancy, you know, accelerometer tool? If you put a sensor right here in this red BHA, it says you're quiet. If you put a sensor right there, it, you know, it, it gives you data that really scares you. So look, even if you have downhole tools, pay attention to them, but be aware that they may not be telling you what's happening in the bit. Uh, and, and look at both of them both the MSC and your downhole uh, data at the same time. And, and one may talk to you when the other doesn't. And in, in, in going through your, your, your BHA design process, I'm, my, my gut tells me that you never want to have your stabilizers at equal placement apart from each other, that, they, that the distance from them has That's to be That's kind of a standard steady. design hog law is don't put things at equal spacing. And more generally, if you can put things closer to each other as you approach the bit and further away as you get further from the bit, uh, you tend to end up with better modeling results. It, that's what I'm told by people who do modeling. Um, so a couple, of, just to address some of the comments that are coming through, uh, I saw somebody say that their limiters for a project that they worked on were ECD uh, related, and we can... We can discuss. No, we might be able to get to that, but right now we want to kind of stay on the bit. But another one was a comment about motors versus um, motor versus RSS, and I think that plays into an ERD well versus a US land well. But ERD wells, I think RSS is almost a given that you're going to be running an an, an RSS on an ERD well, okay. where US land well is typically a motor. Um, yeah. And typically, um, slick, high bend motors. Um, so maybe we, we can, we'll talk about, maybe get into the RSS a little bit, but uh, specifically the U.S. practice of running high bend slick motors, maybe you can comment on that a little bit. Well, I just told you don't run a limber, <laughs> flexible assembly <laughs> at high RPM. <laughs> And you really do see that if you've got a, if you have a slick motor and you, and you increase the R, RPM on the string, if you've got a slick motor, you're going to end up at lower string rotating speeds. Now, then a stabilized one that, that is kind of you, where you figured some things out. But um, having said that, it may not make a difference. If you've got a fast motor on the end of it, and there's, that's what you want to do. If you've got a, 
at least a 242, if not something in the threes, no matter what you're drilling, you know, then whether you're running 40 RPM on your string or 90, doesn't matter. And whether you've got a high bend or low bend, the vendor's going to tell you, okay, well, you know, with a low bend, you can go 110, and with a high bend, you can go 90. Well, what difference does that make? ROP is linear with bit speed. Right. So we probably shouldn't obsess too much with rotating string speeds with bent motors Mm -hmm. because you're not really going to change them that much. Mm -hmm. Uh, Where we really need to obsess is with um, bit speed which mm-hmm. is the motor speed itself. And we, we need to pay more attention to that. For, now, same, a same, way, same way with the rotary steerable. You know, let's put them on motors. Get your weight on bit up, though, mm-hmm. before you start adding RPM, like I said earlier, because what you don't want to do is, is be limited. You know, do your process. Stick with it. Mm-hmm. Let's say I'm limited to 200 feet by, per hour by d- LWD data acquisition rates. Mm-hmm. And... And I'm in lower strength rock. Well, so I raise my weight on bit until I'm buckling, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the only way I can go forward, can't go forward weight on bit, I'm buckling. The right. cheap way to go forward is put a motor on it and turn it three times faster. Right. I have three times as much ROP. Oh, but wait a minute. It doesn't matter because I'm limited by LWD data acquisition rate to 200 feet per hour. Right. So if I put a motor on it, I have to pull the weight on bit almost completely off to stay under 200 feet an hour. So be clean and be honest. I mean, be really rigorous about your, your, your step test and the redesign process. Focus on weight on bit before you start focusing on, and, and then ask, does R, what limits me? And make sure that it's RPM and not something that, that if you get that RPM, you can't use it anyway, and you may even end up doing something bad as a result. I think um, at least in the, in the U.S. now, one of the latest things that's kind of catching hold and, and, and spreading is running a four-and-a-half-inch drill pipe in like six-and-three-quarter-inch hole with a smaller tool joint so it can actually fit, so they can raise the weight on bit. Um, because in a horizontal hole, you're limited by the amount of compression you put on your drill pipe in a vertical hole, you can just increase the size of your BHA. Yeah. So you have, you have either stick slip with the four inch, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. or you buckle, mm-hmm. uh, you become buckling limited or you become stick slip limited. And, and in the same issue as five inch, you just draw longer laterals until you're buckling limited or whatever. Right. So we, we, we push everything out to being buckling limited or torque limited. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the where the economic limit of performance is right now. Uh, in either case, uh, realize it's really important for everyone to realize that bit speed doesn't increase torque. Mm-hmm. So my string do- torque doesn't right. change at all. So it's almost freebie in ROP. So do get torque limited. Do get buckling limited. And the next step is bit speed. Um, now, I don't get it for free, really. I have to use some hydraulic horsepower from over here to drive the motor to do it. But but um, we should be, uh, that, that's our new frontier for unconventionals, really, is bit speed. Mm-hmm. Um, it is for um, smaller diameter drill pipe, but more specifically, because smaller diameter drill pipe is becoming limited at a lower weight on, it limits us at a lower weight on bit basically by either triggering stick slip at a lower weight of bit or by being buckled at a lower weight of bit. And so um, your point's a good one. If you want to go four inch, you better go fast motor. Right. And it, just to tie it into ECD, if you go to four and a half inch and just because it worked in one area, don't think that it's going to work everywhere because that will drive up ECD. And now, now it's, Okay, you ran bigger drill pipe that's more torsionally stiff, so it might reduce stick slip, and yeah. it might it might allow you more weight on bit, but now it causes a, an ECD issue. So. A good good point, Mitch. And and just stick with taking your design changes in order. Yeah. You know what limits me now because it's a lot cheaper, for example, to use four inch and go faster motor than it is to drill bigger hole and upsize all your casing. So. Um, but there is there is a point at which you might need to do that. Um, the what the progression you kind of see over time, and you've seen. I think you guys have probably seen this in extended reach as well. Is that we do things out of economic necessity, like okay, let's get a motor, 
but once you're comfortable with a PDC turning 500 RPM, you're saying, well, even when I have six and five H drill pipe, why aren't I turning them a bit 500 RPM? Because mm-hmm. it drills twice as fast as 250 RPM. Why aren't I doing that? Um, so you see some of that going on now uh, as well. Uh, I'm not buckling in. A, well, you, you're you're seeing, and we need as an industry to move to greater RPM, bit RPM, uh, whether we're um, limited by that, but just be careful that it doesn't do something crazy to you because of some other limiter. And it and it also goes back to the discussion that you you need to do this redesign in every area that you go to because we see it a lot where one company has an engineer that drills wells in the Bakken and then they go to drill wells in the Haynesville. Every, every rig, not <laughs> every area, just every single rig. And it may even vary with, uh, uh, you know, one torque management system is working on one rig, one active torque management system for tick slip, stick slip is working and another one's not working over there. And you really end up with needing five inch drill pipe instead of four. Um, so, uh, if if each rig is trained, no understands the physics, and will work through their own step tests. You can't do step tests on one rig, have a learning, and say, okay, all seven rigs, here's what we learned. You can The learning can be, here's how you do step tests, and have all seven rigs do that. And, and every company needs to build up this gen, kind of general pile of physics and understanding, but don't too quickly abandon, you know, your rig-by-rig rig workflow for identifying limiters and redesigning rig by rig. Fred, this is coming up. Give me mine. RPMs, are they tearing up the hole? Uh, you know, no. Um, and neither are stabilizers, uh, and neither is whirl. Even massive levels of whirl don't tend to do any damage to the whirl, the hole. Uh, this is a really contentious point, and it has a major effect on fear and what people are willing and not willing to do. So it's important. It's a really important question. Um, the if you think if you just do the little bit of engineering math on the contact area, say of a stabilizer or a drill collar that's laying against the wall, you're looking at so much contact area that even if I have if, if my whirl and the mass of steel is impacting 100 times a minute with 15,000 pounds, how much force per area is that? It's very small for, it might be 300 pounds per square inch, and your rock's good for 5,000. If the force doesn't exceed the strength, it doesn't break. And that's ba- just basic engineering. So it just doesn't make sense that you can tear up the hole. Now, what you can do with the stabilizer if you're applying axial load to it in a tight spot, you're not, you're not using all that area. You're using a tiny little eighth of an inch right around the edge of the bottom edge of the stabilizer. And yeah, you can get 5,000 pounds per square inch and you can ream off a hump with it if it's in a real bind. So we see that and we start thinking they can cut rock. Now they're cutting rock because you can apply so much axial load and you're actually on a very tiny contact area, almost like a bet, right? So, but lateral vibration or high speed or forward whirl pressing on the side of the hole, you're talking about hundreds of pounds a square inch. We, we hear that so often when we see significant amounts of wellbore instability where they see these big pieces of rock that are coming out of the hole that were obviously weren't cut by a bit. But you know what's happening, right? So, and we've talked about this, when you have hole enlargement because you don't have enough mud weight, you have high bri- vibration because the pipe isn't stabilized. So in that enlarged hole, I'll go look at, I'll go look at my um, downhole data maybe, and I'll see how vibration correlates with enlarged hole. Well, it didn't cause it. It's a result of it. And that's really what's going on. Because it's so, I mean, for any engineer, it's so illogical to think that that force per area will break rock if you just kind of look at forces per area. Um, and, I, and I will say there are some companies that, that, are promoting that idea. Some operators teach it internally and uh, uh, share it with the world. And um, and I really wish they would. I, I really would encourage them to go back and look closely at that. And if you want to be empirical, we have millions and millions and millions of feet of hole with ten Gs of vibration in gauge hole. Uh, you know, even in extremely soft rock. Mm-hmm. Right. 
We've got a question from the audience. So the question is, um, do you have to change parameters with different formation strengths? It, it's, it's not tied to your formation strength. Uh, do your step test and raise your weight on bit. All formation strength does is determine the depth of cut you will get for a given weight on bit. Because the way it works is that you, you, know, you apply weight on bit, and the more weight you apply, the greater your indent. It's just how much are you going to indent. So if I double the weight on bit, I double the indentation. For a given rock hardness, I get a certain amount of indentation. For And, and, and that's that thing about the bit we call it's aggressiveness. It's how much contact area does it really put on bottom. Bits that don't have much contact area axially are more aggressive because I put weight and they indent more. But you so, would expect the response from that step change to be different in different rock strengths. It's linear right? with either. So yeah. it's, it's, it's linear with weight on bit, but if I have twice as hard a rock, I get half as much indentation for the same weight on bit. Mm -hmm. So these two things are playing together. So if you get a little bit harder rock, raise your weight on bit, and you get the same ROP, mm -hmm. for example. And it's very predictable. Uh, so rock hardness doesn't change my parameters in itself. Now what happens with rock hardness is that I lose depth of cut. Mm -hmm. Well, remember that sine wave I showed you that picture of, you know, and the bit being waggled at the end of it? We need engagement between our bit and the rock. And what ha uh, I'm not fixing my sine wave much, but I'm keeping the bit from reacting to it. If I, if I bury those cutters in it, then they're, they're surrounded by rock. So this is the important thing about hard rock is that the low ROP you see maybe in a hard streak uh, isn't mostly due to the change in rock hardness. There's probably very little change in rock hardness between one streak of shell and the next. But that small change may lose depth of cut that frees the bit to vibrate more, which has a big effect on ROP. Mm -hmm. So it's not the rock hardness per se that did it, but the loss of depth of cut. And it's important to understand that because that's why we need 65,000 pounds on an eight and three quarter bit all the time. I mean, we, you, you do your step test until you're limited. You'll probably eventually reach the structural limit of a bit. You truly will break it if you run too much. And the vendors don't really have precise numbers on that, but a typical eight and three quarter ought to be at 65. A typical 12 and a quarter could be at seven five. You know, you, Either way, you know, we're running eight and three quarters at 55 to 60, and, you know, set in 12 and a quarters being run at 60 to 65 routinely, PDCs. It's about having so much engagement all the time. What happens if you really get your weight up is that it doesn't matter if you run into the hard streaks because you're so deeply engaged that even if you lose, you know, 20% of your engagement because the rock strength went up 20%, you're still stable. You still don't vibrate. So you don't have the massive loss of ROP. You get a smoother, at high weight, you get a smoother, more consistent performance. And more. And MSC will tell you you have a more efficient bit. At low weights, you get big old spikes in ROP and uh, uh, running through the same streaks. It's not the rock strength change itself. It's how much world dysfunction is triggered when I uh, have very little depth of cut and lose it. that. Versus when I have a whole lot of depth of cut and lose a little bit. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes perfect sense. Yeah. E everything gets better if you can really get that bit buried. Uh, there's all kinds of dysfunctions that just get better. Um, yeah. And then work on RPM. We've got another question that kind of ties into RPM. Um, are there any consider considerations for drilling with a turbine? So... Um, That what gets us to it, I'd say virtually never, and a lot of it has to do with how resistant PDC diamonds are to heat now. If, uh, there was a point maybe 10 or 12 years ago where uh, I recall a project in which we gave up on turbines and diamonds. Now, the thing about a natural diamond is it takes heat and speed better. Uh, because we found we could turn a PDC at 600 RPM and 40,000 PSI dolomite, and we didn't have a thermal problem with it. I mean, when you get, we get to that range. Now, if you get super hard, then um, what starts happening with super hard rock is you can't get any indentation depth. 
from a PDC because partly because it has to have that chamfer on it. So the first tiny bit you indent a PDC is really inefficient. You're really drilling with a surface that's like this to the bottom of the hole. You know, you got that chamfer and then you got the diamond face. Either you have no chamfer at all, which makes it re- susceptible to breakage, or if you do have a chamfer and you're drilling five feet an hour, you're not even burying your chamfer. You're actually drilling with your chamfer on their bit. So why don't we just get a big old coarse diamond, stick it in the bottom of the hole and break rock with that instead. And that's kind of what you're doing. Either one in really strong rock, you're going to have a hard problem getting indentation. Yep. You're going to be kind of low ROP. But what I can do with a, a diamond, because it's not bladed, doesn't gear all kinds of good stuff, is it doesn't have whirl of diamond bit, like an impreg bit. It doesn't whirl. Um, and I can turn it twice as fast. And so I'm not getting higher indentation. I'm actually limiting it with my diamond exposure. But I'm getting my ROP back from RPM. And I can't get PDCs in really hard rock uh, to turn 1,000 RPM. So if you look at the drilling out in the industry today, you know, you're not, you're not talking about the Delaware or Oklahoma or, you know, the Appalachian. It's, it's, uh, you, you're really talking about long sections of extremely high strength rock where it still makes sense. Okay, perfect. I got one more question. Um, what about drilling in highly interbedded, uh, highly interbedded formations? And I think you kind of already touched on this previously. Well, Kind of in the interbedded, you know, strength changes a little bit and whirl may change a lot if you don't have high depth of cut. But when we talk about interbedded, we might be talking about the Brushy Canyon, where I've actually have really high strength changes and they're very sharp. I've got, uh, you know, a 15,000 pound shell and then I have a 30,000 pound uh, calcite streak. And geologically, the way they were laid down, I mean, it's just an instantaneous uh, transition there. So part of my bit is in a really hard thing, and while part of my bit is still back in a really soft thing. So now I don't have even loading of the cutters, and I don't have, uh, and, I, and, I, and what, what happens is that all of my weight on bit goes to the thing in the hard thing, those few cutters in the hard thing, which is your nose. They've got so much weight on bit on the nose that they really indent that hard thing. Well, now the stud that that diamond is, it doesn't break the diamond, it's a million PSI you know, resistance. The stud the diamond is breaking on is not built for that much torque. So you'll shear through and you get a hinge failure or breakage into the stud, the stud breaks off. So when you're seeing, when you're going into hard streaks, first of all, it's not that they're hard. It's that they have really sharp transitions. So I can have hard streaks as long as I've got a few inch transition. I'm not putting part of my bit in a hard thing and part of my bit back in soft so that the weight moves. It's really specific. I can't predict that kind of damage. I've got to see it on a bit. And, of course, we see that in the Brushy Canyon and uh, some areas in the Delaware and in the stack, whatever, a few places. Um, you don't predict it, but where you see it, we have solutions for that. We have design changes we can make. Um, and we just published a paper on that last year. Uh, I and uh, Sam Noyner and Todd Cunningham uh, you might Google that, take a look at that. We published that at Galveston uh, last year about the, the Delaware thing and how and some changes you can make. Paul Pastuhis also, we actually wrote ours about exiting the hard streaks because there all your load is still back on the shoulder and your nose loses support and you break the outside cutter. Mm-hmm. Paul Pastusic also check his paper, Google that, um, the one he was involved in that really dealt more with the nose. Uh, and but it's a very active area, and what you're seeing with uh, the wedge-shaped cutters, the shaped cutters, uh, you know, pyramidal cutters, axe blade, all these designs, uh, those really I think were very much encouraged by a few of these places in where we have this interfacial severity. Uh, trying to find the bit, the one bit that will drill the whole Delaware, you know, uh, protective hole basically. And now that you have those features, you're finding they do some other good things too, right? Uh, at least that's how I see that having developed. But um, the the thing about um, hard streaks is in a 10,000-foot well, they're usually 200 feet of the whole well. 
So don't sacrifice your whole well for that bit if it's a low-performing bit in all the other footage. And there's the issue. We start out in the Delaware. We should be making 500 feet an hour easy from the surface casing shoe down to about the top of the Brushy Canyon. where and, and we can make high RPs there too, but we end up having to back off to avoid this damage. So um, if I really dumb my bit down, to only handle the Brushy Canyon, then I'm giving up a tremendous amount of ROP and other animals. Generically, that happens in in lots of wells now because PDCs drill so far. I, I think you made a good point that we're, as an industry, we're kind of hung up with the idea of drilling shoe to shoe in one run, um, which is a good thing, right? But, uh, and you're mentioning, you're mentioning the Brushy Canyon, and I don't want to keep it just to the U.S. in 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 a certain area that you're drilling if half of your section is super soft rock and half of your section is super hard it might make the most amount of sense to have one bit for that super soft rock and drill that super fast and then trip yeah. and change out your bit for it, something appropriate so you can drill the hard it, part it might really it might but I, I would suggest don't just run around empirically trying different things yeah, yeah. Figure out exactly how the bit's being damaged sure. and, the, and where it is and see if you can have your cake and eat it too. For example, why not use speed? What's breaking the bit is tangential overload. Mm -hmm. That's depth of cut, right? Mm -hmm. What if I back off on weight on bit, but I use a lot more speed? I don't change the depth of cut, so I'm not going to have torque. Mm -hmm. So... Now, would that work or not? You know, if it just take a concept like that and say, let's go try it and explain to management this is a pilot. We're trying to evolve a different understanding here so they don't have unrealistic expectations, blah, blah, blah. Do all mm -hmm. that stuff. But make sure you understand the physical thing that's breaking things and then put everything on the table that might work to within that framework, plus keeping your ROP in those other intervals. Mm -hmm. You know, can you have your cake and eat it too? And you might. Um, I feel like that's something we just kind of we look at the numbers and we a new bit and we never think about it. There's a group, you know, right now that is putting together an effort to uh, change our IADC code or how we grade, let's put it that way. And we need to do that. But more than anything, we simply need to photo document all our bits. We need to give up. We need to give up on, on bit grading. Uh, the way we've been doing it. And um, it, it does me almost no good to look at, at an IEDC bit grade. And I'm being harsh a little bit, but it's that I know we can do so much better. We don't need to know whether the inner or outer were damaged. That doesn't tell us how they were damaged. A picture does. And those pictures need to be taken in the right way. So every company needs to establish a photo documentation workflow. to get the bit out, clean it up, you uh, take a, and, and of course you can work with your bit vendors with this, but do it immediately on the rig with the people who ran the bit, if you can. Clean it up really good. Get a close up of each blade, get good light on a blade, and then rotate the bit. If you walk around a bit and take pictures, once some are going to be in shadows, rotate the bit to bring the next bit into the light. Get a picture of every single blade, even if it looks good. I mean, a green bit, a green blade is just as important as a broken one. Get a top view and then get a side view, and that's what you need. Seven blades, you need nine pictures. Get those pictures and make them high quality. And uh, today we can zoom in and see these fine features that really tell us, you know, what really happened. Um, and and now if I can see these features like this right here on the slide that I've got up. If I can actually see those features, then um, I can tell you what caused that. And now I know how to change my practices or the bit design for the next run, and that's what we need to do. All right. The top left bit, the one that's rung out on the sides or whatever, what, what, what would you say caused that if you were to look at that picture? There's no way to know how that started because it's all, it's all gone. There's nothing forensic left to see, you know, like I have right here or even here. Uh, but what I can tell you that those cutters right there are utterly unworn. Yeah. The rock did not do this, right? 
Rock didn't do that. Some kind of, of a dysfunctional event did that. I think I may be touching Fair something enough. that's bringing it up. <laughs> so, um, so what you do once you get your bit photo documentation is you go back into your digital data and the time scale and you zoom in to a very short periods of time. Um, this, the same paper that discussed the Delaware has a discussion of how to use MSE baseline and how diagnostically how to see exactly where damage occurs. So what, what you see in your digital data, if you're watching MSC, as long as it keeps, it'll rise when you have whirl and hard streaks or whatever, it'll come back to the baseline. That baseline is a visual thing. You just zoom out, look at your MSC curve, and find the left-hand side, and you, you can just draw a line right through it. 40, that's at 40,000 PSI, maybe. As long as your bit can still come back to 40,000 PSI, it can't possibly have a big flat spot on it. Because if it's coming back to the same MSE, it has to be coming back to the same efficiency, indentation depth for a given weight on bit. So you know it's green. It's green. And if you start watching that on your wells over and you know, well after well after well, what you see with all bits, all PDCs, is they are green forever until they're not. So you'll drill, uh, you'll drill 5,000 feet, and it's green. And then you'll see it start to trend off to the right, the MSE line, where it starts off is where the damage happened. And then you'll pull it and it'll be DBR'd or born or whatever. Go back in your digital data and zoom in where it diverged from the baseline. Zoom into like, you know, one minute data, one minute of data or as far down as you can get and see what you were doing and what really happened there. So it's more than IDC codes, right? It's actually forensics, figuring out what, cause the damage from the nature of the damage you see on pictures, and then actually connecting that back to the um, EDR and having the person who ran it do it. Now, th this is why you want to do it on the rig, because the driller has, drillers have tremendous sense of responsibility for what they pull out of the hole. They'll find out real quickly that how they ran it was probably more important than which bit they chose in terms of how long it lasted and why it failed and all that, that they have tremendous choices that they can make that make a huge difference if you train them and you do all the right things. So if you send it off and get bit pictures made, you know, days later at some place in Dallas or wherever, and then those photos go in a file somewhere, you get zero value out of all that photo documentation. If the person who ran it takes the pictures, does the kind of investigation. Maybe there's some help from the office and engineer and somebody's got some time. But if they do it themselves, then the next bit you put in the hole will probably get run differently. We, we've spent, we've got, we're about two-thirds of the way through our time and we spent most of it talking about bits and weight on bit limiters and or what limits us from putting higher weight on bit and RPM. Um, maybe we should talk about talk about limiters that are not bit related um <laughs> <laughs> no kidding that's about 80 percent of our footage right <laughs> um so so you're k and m and you're involved in an enormous variety of wealth yeah what limits weight on bit in an extended reach well uh, t let's let's jump to the end when we're when we're out a good distance not not what enables us to get it drilled, but what limits us from raising weight on bit to drill faster at 25,000 feet to throw? I, I wouldn't just say, so there's a lot of things. Um, I, I would say a lot of it is perception related, um, and it's not necessarily weight on bit. Like, uh, weight on bit, I, I did mention it earlier on, that a lot of people just are not willing to exceed what's on the spec sheet. I mean, we see that with um, our uh, motor RPM limits um, uh, all the time. Um, a, lo a lot of it is fear of doing something that you haven't done before. We, we, we worked uh, up in Alaska, um, really soft formation. People were just afraid to drill in more than 100 foot per hour because they thought that if they, if they did, it, bad things would happen. Right, because they hadn't experienced it before, and, and I think that just ties to personal. Like, if you take somebody from um, 
what's the Southeast Asia where they drill like nine thousand well, foot in a day on a regular basis? Yeah, v- Vietnam or whatever. If you took somebody from that environment and put them from Alaska, obviously he would never have that fear just because he he's in an environment where they're drilling nine thousand foot in a day on a regular basis. But and and we went from a hundred to three hundred and fifty. Basically, we became LWD limited, like how fast we can drill to get the acquisition that that they needed to be able to steer and whatnot. And once they saw it, then it was like, and it takes a little bit of an experience. Um, and they saw that it was going to be okay. Um, but that has to do with drilling a stable, stable well bore. Um, if you also, so, you know, having a mud weight, I mean, there's just so many things that tie into, you say you can drill fast and it's not a problem, but. <laughs> You know, there's, you know, I I didn't say that. Well, I I do. I do. I I say, I said, raise your weight on bit till you see what limits you and do something about it. Right. Then you can drill fast. Right. So anyway. Yes. But that, that's a really, that's a, uh, it's almost as if there's kind of a cloud and what happens on extended reach is, is if you kind of come from a low cost environment, you're more aggressive probably. Mm -hmm. And, um, in my experience, and I've worked both kinds of environments, grew up in a very low cost environment. And what I found when I moved into this high cost environment, uh, extended reach order, there's kind of a cloud of, well, it's not really what's important on this well. Mm-hmm. And we're not sure what could go wrong, but all we know is that we want to be careful. So, you know, we're not going to do fast drill on this well because we want to be careful. And that's why I told the story about the trouble time going down. The things, when we say be careful, we're not really saying we're going to do anything but drill slow, but limit weight on bit. Mm-hmm. We're not working stability. We're not really doing anything by this kind of managing from this generalized fear of speed. So, um, but I, I agree with you. And I, I think if you were to kind of state, Something is just fear of speed is the number one thing that we really deal with. I think there's a lot of misconceptions as well. Like on a lot of ERD wells, we're typically running a tapered drill string. And then we see a lot of the time they'll set the stall limit for the top drive at something for maybe the, the, the skinnier drill pipe that's much deeper. When actually that pipe is so much deeper in the well that we're never going to, we're, we're never going to exceed that makeup even if we increase the makeup torque at surface. So we're living ourselves already with these constraints that are, are just mis, misconceived, misinformed. We've got two sometimes unrealistic limits. that, that uh, it's, it's the torque transfer, you know, for tapered string would be a good example of one, but the other is buckling. So... We can't know either of those very easily. We, um, we model to get those. And if the model's wrong, then I mean, if whatever's modeled, we'll do it. Mm-hmm. So if it says we're going to buckle at 35,000, that's all we'll do. And uh, so we do need to look at, in our step test process, let's, let's model, because this is what you guys are powerful at, right? Mm-hmm. Is the well feasible? Um, how much weight on bit will we have at TD? All kinds of questions that you can model and answer, and you're calibrated, right, with all this experience. But when we give a number, uh, you know that it's really dependent on the assumptions that went into it. I'm going to buckle at a much lower weight on bit potentially if I haven't raised enough, don't have enough mud weight to keep the borehole stable because the pop is in bigger hole, literally. So it buckles more easily, right? Uh, you you assume a gauge hole when you do your buckling calculation. Uh, that's probably that's yes. correct. Uh, or, but on the flip side, if you say thirty five, they're just not going to run more than thirty five. Can we actually go st- do step testing weight on bit and physically identify when it actually does buckle, mm-hmm. so that we can run more weight on bit? Uh, modeling to me is for feasibility, and anything I model, I want to invent something that I can go see through an organized testing process Mm -hmm. to see what that limitation really is in the real world because we all know that modeling is, I may have been overly conservative, uh, just as well as under conservative and not assuming there's some instability. So when we also say buckling, like the 
the the concept of buckling is almost like a swear word. Like you never want to you never want to drill with buckled pipe. When in a horizontal well, the pipe is all the pipe is already in compression, and provided that you're not damaging that you, that you're not putting enough stress on the pipe to damage it when you're buckling it, then why why can't you put more weight on the pipe? Why can't you buckle the pipe? You, you might want to say that you know, ten or ten or twelve more times. But <laughs> well, when we put compression on pipe, it's sinusoidally buckles. And it does it all the time. Mm-hmm. And there's not a problem with that. So we need to be really specific about buckling. At what point does buckling actually bother us? Because we're going to drill in a sinusoidal buckling all, always. Um, with extended reach or horizontals anyway. So when do we care about buckling? And how do we know we have it? Yeah, I guess so. Some of it is... I think it goes back to that motor, the motor rotary steerable question. Yeah. Is, do we use a motor or do we use a rotary steerable? And that was something that happened to me early in my career, drilling these long horizontals with a motor 75% of the way through the lateral. We can't, we can't slide anymore. We can't get weight to bit because it was improperly modeled. Mm-hmm. We knew, now that I work at K&M, I could see that we never were going to get to bottom with this motor. We were never going to be able to slide all the way to bottom. And I, I think about all those times I was apologizing to that company man for the for not being able to get that slide in when it was physically impossible. And they should have been telling me that mm-hmm. you won't be able to slide. You're going to have to rotate this out to the DD. So, you know, having a good model, understanding whether or not you need to pick a motor or rotary steel is key to successfully drilling a lot of these. Well. And sometimes and, it's the wrong choice. And even with a rotary steerable, there, like if you're drilling a horizontal, the model will tell you there's a maximum weight on bit that you can run on a specific drill pipe in a specific hole size before it buckles. And when you're rotary drilling, whatever you apply on surface, unless you're drilling extremely fast, that, that, that is transferred to the bit. So if you're applying 35,000 at, at surface, you're getting close to 35,000 at the bit for how fast the bit's moving with that rotation, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I think... Mm, just like the bit vendors, I think we're kind of uh, we're, 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 we might be the cause of this a little bit. Also, is because if it, when you buckle pipe, you put a certain amount of bending stress on it, right? And that's why that's why we don't want to rotate buckled pipe because if you if it's cyclical bending stress, that's eventually going to cause cracks and twists off and whatnot. But the amount of bending stress is very different with five inch five inch drill pipe an eight and a half inch hole or nine and a half inch hole versus five and a half inch five and a half inch drill pipe and eight and a half it's how how much annual clearance you have if you have a lot of annual clearance then it looks like you're the pipe on the far right where you actually will cause a lot of damage and eventually twist off but if it's you know if it's buckled just a little bit then the bending stress is not that bad and the cyclical um damage is or the the bending stress is not that high and and you can rotate buckle pipe without without a whole lot of problems um i think one thing that is also difficult is the diagnosis or or i guess the the result of of um high weight on bit can either be uh, it, oscillating torque can be the cause of one of two things with high weight on bit is, is stick slip or rotating buckled pipe because rotating buckled pipe it does generate a lot of friction on the side of the hole and it tends to look like stick slip when you're rotating buckled pipe so it becomes very different it like you said early on you need to identify what the root cause of your limiter is so you appropriately solve it right so how do you distinguish between oscillating torque being the result of stick slip or rotating buckle pipe or stabilizers in whirl creating drag or there's yes. three uh, really three things okay that uh they learn something new every day so <laughs> uh if you have a motor you know well the um There are ways of doing 
some of that I, that, that I have done. And I don't know about the buckling induced because I don't know that I've seen in my own experience buckling induced. So I haven't tried to kind of sort through that. But, mm-hmm. but when you have drag, you know, we think of stick slip being something that kind of kicks in at high bit torque. And what mm-hmm. stick slip is, is actually a twisting of the entire string and the four bit just screwed on the end. Mm-hmm. So when the string twists forward, the bit goes faster. When it twists fat backward, the bit goes slower. Mm-hmm. We don't really care if it does that. They do them all the time. Unless when it goes backwards, it goes so fast that it comes to a complete stop. It means its backward rotation is faster than your top drive mm-hmm. or your motor and your top drive together. If a bit stops and then accelerates out of that, that's when we do damage. So as long as I've just got what I call speed oscillation and not full stick, mm-hmm. then I'm going to keep putting more weight on a bit and it's going to keep bidding bigger and bigger. I don't care. I'm drilling faster and I'm not doing any damage until I get the full stick. So in the diagnostic that I do while drilling, while doing step tests with weight on a bit and I start seeing torque oscillation, I don't care. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm actually looking for asymmetric cycles like this right here. That indicates full stick. As long as my cycles are symmetric in torque, then I'm not worried. So there's that. If I do see <coughs> uh, stabilize, stabilizers don't drag, they don't create torque. So get over that, right? Mm-hmm. Unless they're in whirl. So I need, if I see an indication of whirl, like a high bit MSC, because it's on the end of that sine wave, and coupled with high torque oscillations, I get real s- suspicious that the stabilizers are actually where the torque is coming from. They're not fundamentally causing the oscillation, which is kind of a depth of cut oscillation deal, but they're powering it up with more torque, so it gets bigger. Roller reamers. So because the stabilizers are getting slammed into the side of the hole, they're... <clears throat> slammed or just pressed harder and they're, harder they're, they're and harder. They're creating that reactive torque from the rotation. Yeah. So, so solve the fundamental whirl problem, right, in your BHA, or if you... In the meantime, while you can't do that, replace your stabilizers with a roller reamer, and they don't create that torque. They may, they do not fix in the world, but you, they just don't create the torque. And we wrote a whole paper on that. You can Google my name in Sockland Island work. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did that for a while until we could actually get our stabilizers and that you know that rotary steerable system worked out so that it was just a really dead quiet system. Uh, ultimately, you know for. All of these vibrational problems, it's if you've got a rotor steerable system, you should be able to eventually design yourself into a dead quiet system, and that's where you want to go. Um, and then you lock it down. You don't let the geologist make a single change. <laughs> you can't move anything, right? So, uh, but, so, so I think those are the, those are the options. For stick slip, faster speed motor is the easiest thing to do, and it massively elevates the weight on bit at which you're going to have that torsional oscillation. If it's driven by the stabilizers or roller reamer until you can redesign to eliminate the fundamental shape of the sine wave, for, for buckling, you know, reduce the weight on bit. So what you should see, um, so, so what I think I've seen with, with helical buckling is uh, a sharp rise in torque. Mm-hmm. And so for me, what I'm looking for when I'm doing step tests is a sharp rise in torque. And there's nothing about adding weight to the bit should sharply increase the target. It should be a linear response. So I'm looking for that, and, I'm, and I know the situation my well. I know I'm on the, on the edge anyway. I'm 45,000 pounds to 50,000 pounds on a 5-inch drill string with a 10-degree bill right and a 10,000-foot lateral. I know where I am, right? So I think you put different clues together. But my, my takeaway, my important takeaway is that we should be teaching, figuring out, and maybe you guys can do more work on this, but... How do I operationally know that I have a problem? Because how do I do, what do I recognize during a step test? Because I want to get away from depending entirely on a model to actually proving it in every well. The other thing that happens is that you just make your crew so smart. And anytime I can make them smart, instead of saying, don't exceed this, saying, go do the step test and identify it. And then they start thinking through all kinds of things were associated with that. Suddenly they start worrying about hole enlargement. Mm-hmm right, for buckling reasons. Um, So operationally for buckling, I'm just going to throw this out. First of all, watch your shell shaker. If you have cavings, raise the mud weight. Mm -hmm. That's your primary 
uh, defense for unexpected buckling? Because you did your modeling, right? You right. should be able to drill your well. Watch your shell shaker and establish that shaker surveillance deal. And I've talked about that before. If it's a caving, you teach your people to recognize the difference between a caving and a cutting. And if it's a caving, have a conversation. And we've talked, I've done talks on this, but if it's a certain kind of caving, you're not in big trouble. If it's a certain kind, you are. But react and raise your mud weight. And the, and the reason why Fred's mentioning this is because one of the things that drives buckling resistance is how much annual clearance you have, right? So Pretty it, sensitive, right? Right. It is sensitive to that. So if you have hole enlargement, then you have more annual clearance, your buckle, your pipe will buckle under lower weight on bit, yeah. and your bending stress will be worse because it'll the, the, the shape of the buckling will be much worse and you'll be more likely to twist off. Yeah, I'm not going to worry too much about bending stress personally mm-hmm. because I just haven't had that experience of I've seen some high buckling and I've seen drilling with high buckling without permanent damage. Mm-hmm. And uh, and our tubes are so flexible relative to our tool joints that I think I think uh, the tube is making contact and limiting that some. I mean, there's stuff going on maybe, mm-hmm. but um, uh, I am worried. I'm wor- I'm worried about weight transfer and. Uh, yeah. um, uh, is as well. The the other thing is set your casing on bottom. You got a mandrel hanger. Don't leave that, you know, forty to eighty feet of twelve and a quarter hole for your mm-hmm. five inch drill pipe to buckle in. Yeah. Try to get uh, fig, figure out how you get comfortable with getting your casing on bottom, closer to bottom with a manual hanger. It's 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 in large hole. That's what it is in your in your lateral. Uh, Especially or, if it's a low angle where you have no buckling resistance. It buckles yes. instantly. Yeah, and, and of course that's a big point, right? It's it's a bigger deal at low angle or sixty five degrees versus ninety. Maybe a little difference. But the um so raise your weight on bit till you see buckling and then back off from that. And and that's how you find your limiter is from torque. Now um that's something that you guys might think about and, and look at your data and your experiences to see if that alone is okay. Um, but first make sure you have gauge hole. And we also want to do that for cutting for ROP limited hole cleaning. If you're, if you have a gauge hole, any eight and a half hole should be drillable at 500, 600 feet an hour. No problem with normal flow rates and very normal fluids. So if you're finding pack offs or spikes or whatever, at less than a very high flow uh, drill rate, you, ha- you don't have gauge hole. And, and you need to go figure out why. Well, the best way to figure it out is not go back to your model. Go back to, your sh- to have a shaker surveillance program and see where you had cavings. And uh, better than that, when you see cavings, raise your mud weight and you won't. And so now you can drill as fast as you want to. So gauge hole, you know, I think of it primarily as uh, incredibly important for me to work hole cleaning limited ROP. Because I've seen holes packing off at 150 feet an hour that, that when we raise the mud weight and drill them a gauge, wouldn't pack off at 700 feet an hour. It's that big. Yeah. Right. And we could spend a lot of time talking about the mechanism for what happens in that hole. But the, uh, uh, it's like everything else. We, we just keep living with all these survival things. We live with them and live with them. And as long as we get the well down, we're okay. We don't want to do that. We want to identify what limits us and and take it completely out of the ball game. And that's everything. All these things talk to each other, like hole enlargement. It's talking to buckling. It's talking to cuttings transport, getting casing on bottom, um, vibrations that do damage. Uh, um, I'd say that's connected. So we are getting close to the end of our plan time, right? Um, we, uh, we've been talking – uh, David Gibson and Vidor Locksmith, and he, he actually, we tried to plan these out, so we kind of go back to back to give the viewers a, a blast of information. So he actually delayed his to start in about half an hour. So we'll definitely have to be wrapped up by then, but we, it does give us a little bit more time. I was monitoring questions that were coming through on our laptop, but my, my, my battery died. So uh, <laughs> we do have other people that are monitoring. So if we have any last minute questions, we can take those before we, before we sign off. Um, maybe, uh, m- maybe while we're waiting on questions. Oh, here. Oh, we have one right now. One so it says, 
When drilling with high weight on bit with a motor in varying formations, <clears throat> is there a risk of inducing stick slip as the load of the power section changes? I don't, I don't think I would connect those directly. Um, high torque at the end of the string. I mean, the stick slip is not a bit, exactly just a bit uh, phenomena. It's actually a, a forward and backwards twisting of the string at its natural resonant period. You set this thing up at its natural resonant period. It, you know, it's five seconds to 10 seconds usually for major swings. Um, what happens at the bit is that when the string winds, it shortens, so depth of cut goes down. Mm -hmm. When it unwinds, the string lengthens, so depth of cut goes up. So you get a torque oscillation from the bit, from the oscillation in its depth of cut. <coughs> if I drill in and out of hard streaks, I get a change in torque, same thing, but I don't get it perfectly matching the resonant period of the string, so I don't power up the twisting motion. So Coming in and out of hard streaks in itself doesn't trigger stick clip. Um, more likely, you know, as you go into a long hard streak, and you some you know, put more weight on it, you have higher torque, and you could get, you could provide the power required for the string to do its naturally resonant thing. Um, uh, but I don't, I don't think just streaky formations really correlate to stick slip. The, and and look at your torque oscillations. Uh, you'll see torque change. But this is a perfectly repeating oscillation and torque. And this is this is what speed oscillation looks like. There's a second resonant period, kind of little humpity hump in here. But that period from peak to peak, the time, peak to time, peak to time, it's almost perfectly the same every time. And and if you're not perfectly powering that on exactly the right moment, then you're not really going to have this stick slip. I saw you had a slide on on instability in the product. Do you 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 want to bring that up and talk about it just for a few minutes? Uh, well, the the problem with an, what happens at high angle is that we form an equilibrium bed. Um, you you don't have anything picking your cuttings up. So as they travel sideways, they eventually hit bottom. There's no flow in the vertical direction, and it doesn't matter what your viscosity is or whatever. It's just still going to hit bottom. So they hit bottom actually until they fill the hole up. And while they're filling the bottom of the hole up, the flow area is declining. When you get enough, small enough area, your velocity reaches a point where it can roll what's on top of the bed. There's still not, nothing to pick the bed up. But now you have enough velocity and shear force right along the top. You can roll the cuttings on the top. The bed down here just sits there. But what you're moving from then on as you drill ahead, all your cuttings are traveling across the top of that bed. They're not being carried. Mm -hmm. they're, they're hitting bottom still, but you develop a transportable layer here that just rolls and rolls. And if you watch clear plexiglass full-scale things, you just see a layer skipping along. Mm -hmm. Well, the same physics apply in big hole. You fill until you reach that same velocity, uh, thumbs, that same area, basically. Because when you, it's not until you reach that same area that you have that same velocity that will roll stuff. So the problem with big hole is that it's not necessarily just the big cavings in it that are hard to move or whatever. It's all your cuttings that you deposit there. You will always have a very large stored mass. And when you, when you disturb that stored mass trying to get out of the hole or you bring your pump rate up too fast and have a pressure surge or anything that disturbs it and moves even a small percentage of that won't fit in the gauge hole above. And that's why we pack off. So if you create big hole, you just end up with a really tedious process. And the bigger it is, the more likely it is that you, make, you basically can't get that cleaned out without a sticking a stuck pipe event. Um, here we again, we're living with stuff instead of just making it go away. And um, uh, that's, that's why uh, we have problems with big hole. Uh, it's storage mass. And it will always fill completely up to a very high level. Yeah, I want to go back to, to Fred's point about having a shell shaker uh, program, watching your shell shakers. This is a very common thing, and I see it all the time. You see a daily report coming in from the rig, and they just say lots of cuttings coming cuttings, over the shakers. They call them cuttings, right? And then a few days go by, and then it just says large pieces. No one, I, I guess there's fear of calling them at cavings, but that's, that's part of it is training you guys on the rigs to be able to 
recognize, identify cavings and stability because yeah. you these yeah. are the roads. And then when we get when they get a call from, uh, when we get a call from them, oh, we didn't have whole problems at all. We don't know why we got packed up. We don't know why we got stuck. And yeah, I, I blame I, I blame management for a lot of things, mm-hmm. and it's a bit unfair, you know. But uh, if I don't blame them, I blame engineers. And that's still a little bit unfair. We did, we did a study of a year's worth of trouble time back when we used to have trouble. Um, and we probably, I think we had 19 major stuck pipe events on high angle wells that year. Should have been in the early 2000s. And, uh, but we went back and really looked hard at them. Uh, and in every, every case, it just said it. There wasn't a clue. They were just suddenly stuck. Yep. And then you go back and you call the rig and talk to the rig supervisor and say, "Well, you know, we had a lot of cavings on the shaker for maybe a day or two before that, but we didn't really have any problems." And that is actually what. And it, and it turned out that there wasn't a single stuck pipe event that we didn't have an early warning that told us to raise the mud weight. You know why? We believed in the model. Our workflow, the engineers did the model. The engineers gave them the number. What do you want? It's kind of a, it's just kind of how we partition out our jobs. And, and, um, and, uh, and at that moment, you know, the early 2000s, there hadn't been the kind of wells we drilled now. So um, that's why we invented shaker surveillance. That's why we said, well, okay, from now on, we're just going to see what's out there, and we're going we're gonna to run our business on that no matter what the model says. And we had the best modeler, I thought, in the whole industry doing that work. It wasn't that. It's that when you get surprised, it's usually by a shell strength that's lower than you had in the offset. It's not you're drilling in a different direction, though that could matter. The earth just isn't that uniform. And you get a shell with a slightly different mineralogy, it can have a dramatically different strength, and it just won't, it just needs more mud weight. So when you model a lot, people who model the most have the most respect for the real world. If they also, it's also a job to follow up and actually see the result, and that's what happened there. So, what is your opinion of bad luck? This hole was just, we just, I, I think bad it's luck. arrogant to think that you can anticipate everything that might happen to you. Uh, and and design it out and would I, I think that's the whole luck thing is why it's so important that you be really rigorous in your approach to performance and re-engineer what limits you before you move on. And also it's so important that if you do that you'll find that this kind of stuff that you're leaving hanging around out there, it is just it's not just bad luck. Most of those you had choices about, and they didn't cost you anything to get rid of them. It was so cheap. It's more about having a workflow and processes that really drive you to, to deal with those things. Um, it it just still, still doesn't eliminate that you might not know something that will happen, but it, it um, I, I, I look at, you know, that's, it's automation, right? It, it's a big deal. Everybody says, well, we can land an airplane, right? And my response to that is, we don't fly airplanes. The correlation with how we drill, especially our difficult wells, is take one engine off and one of the wings, and now let me see your computer land it. I mean, <laughs> if things are linear, predictable, if, they, if they're not nonlinear, if we can make them linear, if we can make them predictable, um, if we, and especially if they are nonlinear, some things are, some responses, if they're not the same nonlinearity every time, you can't automate. Well, the same thing is kind of happening in our wells is that as we eliminate all these things, we're making everything we do suddenly has a linear, responsible, predictable thing coming back. And you, you'll just see trouble go away and, and lots of things get simple. The, the first world record well at Sockland drilled in 44 days with 1% trouble time. That was at the end of, I don't know, 20-some-odd wells where they'd redesign what limited, what limited, what limited, what limited, what limited, what limited. I mean, they were at the point there was nothing left to go wrong, really, because the same things that cause trouble limit ROP. There's no vibration in that bottom assembly, running dead quiet, half a G, almost the entire well. Good grief. What can go wrong? 
four intervals, four bits. I think one of them filled just about green after 10,000 feet. And you do it in 44 days and set three casing strings on the world's longest well. That's what happens if you really stay on, on the path by rig, by field, you know, by team. Um, but you did say that it wasn't, it was not on well one. It took 20, it was 27 <laughs> wells later. So it, there is an iterative process there. On well one, we hadn't implemented fast drill. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 I'll tell you that the well after we went to Sockland and did training was really, really fast. Yeah. It was a major uh, step forward. Okay, we've got one more question. Where is the stick slip index coming from, <clears throat> from downhole tool measurements, and is it mnemonic to follow in real time? I, I don't know what the stick slip index is. Uh, uh, that can be in different things from different vendors. Uh, different EDR companies plot a stick slip index. Uh, the, the granite well we just drilled, for example, that particular EDR vendor, which is not one we use in the petroleum industry much, uh, I was able to correlate a stick slip index of 40 with about the point at which we started seeing our uh, curves go nonlinear, our cycles go nonlinear, meaning we were at full stick. I don't even know how they calculate it. What's a 40? What's a stick slip index of 40? The, there are several indexes out there, and I would, I would talk to the vendor and ask them what it physically means. Typically, if you're using surface data for an index, it's using the magnitude of the torque cycle rel relative to its midpoint. And, but to actually calculate whether the bit is stopping or not, you've got to know the drag, the stiffness of all the string components. You actually have to do a full string model to know how much this level of torque cycle at the sur surface translate to changes in bit speed. And, and I think there's one system, one commercial system that ExxonMobil helped a vendor develop that actually that does that. I don't, there may be others now. But um, almost all indexes are a simple uh, kind of a, you know, magnitude of the cycle versus midpoint kind of thing. They're not really calculating whether your bit's coming to a full stop or not. And uh, so, but if you were to if you watch that index and you watch your cycles and see when they go asymmetric, you may be able to find a correlation with that vendor's index and when they really are doing that, when I it think really is stopping. Some of them also have how fast is it? It's accelerating at the and surface. No, at, at, the the, tool. at the tool. Oh, but if you got data at the tool, you simply have RPM. When RPM right. zero, then you have. Full right. Stick slip. Right. right. But but that's not how the directional provider will flag it as being bad. They'll say if it if it accelerates torsionally at a certain oh. g, now, but that so, is so much lower than the limit for lateral vibration that I always I always question the validity. Well, of, I, 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 what I teach my students is if you go to full stick, that's really bad. Don't yeah. do that. Right. But talk to your vendor because they may know their own tools acceleration limits. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we see stick slip where it's about every five seconds. It, you know, if you go from zero to 600 RPM and back to zero in five seconds, there's some serious acceleration inside the electronics. And, and the vendor should know what, they should have tested out their tools and have some feel for what they like. And it may be less than full stick slip. Mm -hmm. It could be simple speed oscillation, some level of it they have an issue with. So do talk to them about that. Now, if, if they are costing your money with, they're not typically costing you money with that. You just fix the fix the speed oscillation anyway that's bothering them. Mm -hmm. um, faster motors, you know, uh, torque management system. If they really were costing you money, go find another vendor or have the same conversation with another vendor. You could do that, but that you almost never want to change vendors to solve a problem. I, I'll throw that out there. Uh, work with competent people that are, and that are, have a real interest in improving their product, and they failures and all that. As long as everybody's kind of moving to redesign what limits their product, then I would encourage the industry to nurture those people. Okay, we've got one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. What do we do when we don't get good depth of cut in uh, soft and ductile clay formations? So the, 
you always you, you should always have a linear response to wait on bit no matter what you're drilling. That's the whole fundamental of how the MSE curve works. Uh, if you're not getting a linear response, then MSE would go up. In um, from a rock, from a bit mechanics standpoint, the word ductile doesn't um, doesn't quite mean what you might think it does. So I, I don't use the word ductile ever. It's just low strength and high strength. I don't use soft and hard. I just see higher strength and lower strength. You get a linear change with rock hardness, and that's what should happen. So there's nothing different now. If you're shallow and you're in sticky clays, maybe that's what we mean by ductile. Maybe someone's using the word that way. It's bit balling. If you add weight on bit and you don't get a linear increase, meaning if MSE doesn't stay the same, just draw a straight line kind of, that's bit balling. Most, most likely it's bit balling. And so uh, is it a reactive clay or using a water-based mud? You know, add a few other factors in there to confirm it's bit balling. You won't see it necessarily on the surface when you pull it out of the hole. There may be nothing on the bit, but you, you kind of have to understand the physics of bit balling, but um, that's what it is. If, uh, uh, if you see that, increase your bit hydraulic horsepower per square inch, HSI. That's smaller nozzles and higher pressure drop, maybe a higher flow rate. Uh, shallow 12 and a quarter, so that'll be 900 to 1,100 gallons per minute. And then you screw your nozzles down to HSI, a bit HSI of, of uh, a higher one. There's an industry standard around bit HSI of about four horsepower per square inch, and it's it doesn't mean anything. It, I don't even know where it came from. That would be almost impossible to achieve in large size. Holes. In large holes, you yeah. can't get there, yeah. right? Yeah. So, but yeah. you certainly can in twelve and a quarters, um, and seventeen and a half inches, maybe, maybe. But the key is the higher your bit HSR, the higher the founder point is. Balling doesn't happen at really, really low weight on bits, like one or 2,000 pounds. You may start to see it at only four or 5,000 pounds weight on bit in really uh, reactive shells. The more HSI you have, the higher the founder point will be, meaning you, it's exactly that plot I showed you. You can raise your weight on bit to a higher value with higher HSI. With a higher HSI, you can raise it to an even higher, higher HSI. Higher. So I've seen this go from you know 150 feet an hour max ROP to 600 feet an hour by changing the HSI on a bit. We were literally balling at 150 with an HSI of I think one and a half, which is absurdly low for water basin and soft shells, to an HSI of seven or eight. Right. So there is no threshold for HSI. You. You take the approach, you raise it, and to see how, what limits you. It may not be balling anymore. It may be your data acquisition rate. Raise HSI and see what limits you. See, have you elevated the balling point? You use your MSC curve and step test to see that. You keep going until something limits you. And if someone says, well, you'll erode the bit, we'll say, well, I'm going to go run it, and we'll see if we erode the bit. Well, little erosion doesn't bother anything unless you're you know, renting your bits, quit renting your bits, right? It, it, there's all kinds of solutions to the collateral reasons we don't want to raise HSI. You will not, 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 not greatly wash your hole out with higher bit velocity. Uh, and that's physics. Um, to enlarge a hole, the impact impingement force has to exceed the strength. And even at very soft formations, we don't tend to do that. Really shallow, above 1,000 feet, we can with nozzle velocities in the 300 to 400 range feet per second, but we don't run those, right? But if you were in enlarging it a little bit, your only problem, it, as the hole moves away from your nozzle, the velocity falls. So it, it can't make your hole very large. It can make it a quarter of an inch to maybe three quarters larger if you're very shallow, very soft with very high nozzle velocity. And that is a problem for rotary steerables, vertical steering tools, and bent motors. They need push off a perfectly gauged hole, and your bit's creating that over gauge right at the bit. So what you do is you set up a small velocity, small nozzles, constrain your flow rate until you get into comp more competent rock, and then you bring it up and keep going. Or, or you, you work out a scheme to deal with that. Um, I can always adjust my flow rate to eliminate that enlargement. And, and number one, you're not going to see any at 200 feet per second. You know, it's really... The higher HSIs where you could have some, once you get below about 1,000, 1,500 feet, just forget any kind of erosion or enlargement of the hole at all. That's not what's happening. 
It's, uh, well, we have shallow sands that wash out. I have a whole slide here on that. Nope, not that. You need filter cake with bridging solids big enough to plug the pore throats and a filter cake on top and maybe one nine or one nine and a half mud weight to hold it all back. You, you have a boral stability problem. You don't have a washout problem. And finally, just stop saying washout. <laughs> just, you know, my, all my students know they will flunk the course if I hear that word. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Because it's led us to so many horrible, horrible operational decisions. Call it enlargement. You know, we have a little enlargement from whatever. We try to tell all of our guys to it's don't say washout, say overgate. It's washout almost sounds as though it's 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 something that happened that you have no control over that you just have to accept, which I don't believe it. Yeah, second. don't say ballooning. Uh, don't say the bottom dropped out of the hole when you lose returns and it won't stand full. Uh, just don't don't get me started. <laughs> Okay. Well, awesome. Well, thank you very much, Fred. Thank was, you very much. It was a Thanks, very good discussion, Thanks. very enlightening. Thank you very much for everybody that, uh, that watched and attended. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more questions that we haven't gotten to, and um, we'll, we'll make every attempt to get, to get back to you on all those. You bet. And um, you have about 10 minutes to use the restroom, grab a cup of coffee, and then jump on the V-Door locksmith, <laughs> the, 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 ne- the next one. But thank you for, for those that hung around for an hour and 50 minutes. Thanks for spending time. I hope you learned something out of it. And thanks for, thanks for Fred for taking the time to come and join us. I really appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate it guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thanks. And we will do this again next, next month. I believe. I think we're sticking with the we- same schedule. Third, third Friday of the month. Yeah. Third Friday of the month. We'll have another one next month. So join us next month. Put it on your calendar. Thank you, guys.